folks, and welcome to my channel. My name is Erin McGough. I'm a filmmaker and content creator based in New York. And today we are talking about the five most common and crucial mistakes I see beginner freelancers make. If you want to not have a boss, work for yourself, go on vacation whenever you want, work whatever hours you want, sleep in every day, make an unlimited amount of money, working however much, wherever much you want, freelancing might be the perfect career for you. And it might not. It's not the perfect career for everybody, but the reason that so many people don't ever attempt a freelancing career is because one, it's super gatekept. Like, I'll be honest, like a lot of freelancers don't share the information because it makes it more competitive. Like we don't want more competition. But two, a lot of people are scared. They think, oh, like how am I gonna get healthcare? You know, there's so much security in a regular job, blah, blah, blah. And it's so funny because to me, the most secure job I can imagine is being self-employed. Like I lit, I can't get fired. Nobody can lay me off. It's the most secure job in the world. But when people first get started out in freelancing, they tend to make the same mistakes. So first up, the most common mistake that I see when people are just trying to dip their toes into freelance is not picking a monetizable skill. You can't be a freelancer if you're entitled. If you think people are just gonna come to you, you have to be willing to go to the marketplace and say, what is needed here? What is in demand? I once had somebody message me and they were so frustrated. They were like, Aaron, I've been trying to freelance now for a month and I'm not getting any leads. And when I do, they're like for no money. And I was like, okay, what service are you offering? And I don't remember exactly what they said, but it was something along the lines of like a religious consultant. And maybe it's a very legit in demand thing, but I've never heard of that before. And I've never come across it in any top 10 freelancing skills in demand. But just a side note, if you're gonna try and offer a soft skills based freelancing service, like consulting or something like that, uh, yeah, you gotta have a whole different approach to that. You gotta have like a, a robust network, really strong relationships and case studies, and you gotta be ready to like, you know, play the long game there. If you're really trying to make money quickly in freelancing, you got to get niched down. You gotta find where industries are spending a lot of money. Like right now it's like software engineering, web development is huge, like UX, UI design, mobile app development, like technical things like that. Freelancing is all about specializing in a technical skill. So if you're telling me you're trying to like freelance as a teacher, or freelance as like a project manager, I'm like, okay, um, does anybody want a freelance teacher? Does anybody want a freelance project manager? Let's see. So go to like Fiverr, Upwork, the two biggest like freelance marketplaces. And in Upwork, you can go up to find work for my skills. You press command F, search for jobs that include the word teacher or education. Here's a, a mathematics tutor. So I guess that could be an option for you. But in the education industry, I'm not seeing a ton of demand for freelancers because in the education industry, that's just not really how that works. Like agencies, for example, in the creative industry where I work, they constantly need freelancers. But in education, it's like, it's all salary job. But I want to encourage you to be open-minded. For example, if you are a teacher trying to get into a freelance career, maybe you're a good writer. And if you're willing to write as your freelance gig, there are tons of writing jobs, technical writing, ghostwriting, copywriting, grammatical, translation. There are tons and tons and tons endless writing jobs. And if you wanna increase your rate, you know, you can always get like a certificate or something online, like a LinkedIn learning certificate or, or graduate from a Coursera class. Like there are tons and tons of ways to do that. And then if you get that certificate, if you, if you pass that course, you can go from charging 30 bucks an hour as a copywriter to $500 an hour. Like the, the jump can be so, so, so big if you learn the right skill. But again, if you're really, really, really trying to make money, you have to find a skill where people are willing to pay the big bucks. Okay, moving on. I swear the rest of them are not as long-winded as that first one, but it just, it really annoys me when people are so entitled. It's like, well, I, I tried to freelance as a unicorn trainer and nobody hired me. And it's like, yeah, nobody needs a unicorn trainer. Okay, the second most common mistake that I see is people wasting so much time setting up a business that doesn't exist yet. I hate it when I read freelancing 101 blogs and it's like, step one, set up an LLC. And I'm like, no, that that is not important right now. That should be the very last thing on your to-do list. I never had an LLC, ever. I was a sole proprietor for five years and then I developed an S-Corp. Professional freelancer, six-figure earning freelancer, never had an LLC. So to step back, there are two like categories of freelancers. So the first one is a sole proprietor. You don't have to do anything to be a sole proprietor. It's just you're self-employed. It's just how you do your taxes. There's nothing you have to do. You can literally just use your social security number. And if you would like, you can get an EIN and you can use that on your tax documents so you don't have to 
write your social security number with all of these client contracts and stuff. But that's it. You're just self-employed. That's all it is. The other category is that you can set up an LLC, a limited liability company. The benefits to setting up an LLC is that your business is now separate from you as an individual. You get a bit more legal protection because your assets for your business, like say you have a bunch of expensive cameras, those are now owned by your company and not by you. So if somebody like sues you, they don't get what belongs to your company. But that's pretty much it. Like setting up an LLC and being a sole proprietor is pretty much the same thing besides the legal protections that you would get in an LLC. Again, I never had one. You can totally set one up if you want to. If you want to separate that out and you want to have like your separate business from who you are, totally fine. Not the first thing you have to do. <laughs> Absolutely not. In the first year, just worry about figuring out what your unique monetizable skill that you are going to be offering is and building your portfolio and relationships. That's it. Now, I will say though, the only businessy thing that I think that you should get started from the very beginning is accounting. Because when you're self-employed, taxes is like a thing. So if you're if you're making money, you should get QuickBooks or FreshBooks or Wave, whatever. QuickBooks is what I use, it's what a lot of people use. Because you need to keep track of your income and your expenses for tax season. So this is something that you can start doing day one. You can also just keep track of it in like a spreadsheet if you want. But I would just say, be aware of your income and your spending from day one. Cause a lot of the times people, when they're setting up their freelancing career, they'll like spend a lot of money forming an LLC and subscribing to all these things and buying these softwares. And it's like, you need to keep track of all those expenses because when it comes to tax time, you need to deduct those. We're gonna talk about that later. Okay, number three, the third most common mistake that I see is people try to do too much. If I meet a freelancer and they're like, I'm a web slash graphic designer who's also a virtual assistant, but I specialize in copywriting. Whoa, that's a lot. And then like, I'll move on. Cause it seems like they're like a little earlier on, they're experimenting with different things and they don't specialize in something. It's okay to, to do a lot of things, but you have to figure out what your unique offering is. For example, I'm an editor who specializes in short form from trailer to TikToks. Yes, I've edited a feature. Yes, I've edited music videos. Yes, I've done commercials. But if you try to advertise everything at somebody, they don't know what to grasp onto. So first, get really, really good at your primary offering. I am an expert short form video editor, but I also provide secondary services in like motion graphic design, color correction, and sound design. Get really good at one thing before moving on to the next. You feel me? Okay, number four, the fourth most common mistake that I see is that people don't manage their money correctly. So I know, I know, I said that you don't have to go through all the legal work of setting up your company and getting all fancy and stuff, but when it comes to money and the IRS and your taxes, you got to be on top of that stuff. Because when you are self-employed, there is no company that is responsible for withholding your taxes. You have to do that. That means come tax season, you have to write a check to the government, a big old donation to the government to pay for the roads. and other things. But don't worry, it's not that hard. It's just a lot of people don't know that. They don't know that when the company gives them the money for the project, that they have to save some of that to pay in taxes. So for example, let's say that you charge a company a flat fee of $10,000 for a project. Immediately when that hits your bank account, set aside $3,000, 30% for taxes. Fortunately in the US, our taxes are actually pretty low compared to like other places in Europe. But you can also shave a lot off of how much you owe the government by doing business deductions, business expenses, write off. That's a write off. That's a write off? Yeah. Do you even know what a write off is? Uh, yeah. It's when you buy something for your business and the government pays you back for it. Oh, and who pays for it? Nobody, you write it off. Who writes it off? I don't know, the government, the write off people. What? Why are we having this conversation? That all comes later when you get an accountant. Like this is a bit later into the process. You know, if you're not making over $10,000, like, you know, you don't need to like stress out too much about this. But to be safe, I would always set aside 30% at the end of the year, and then you can write your check and pay the government. But only after you have deducted everything. And that's how freelancers can make so much money. <laughs> the US government tax system, they want to reward entrepreneurs. Like they want us to be self-employed. So if your freelancing career is going good and you're like, oh wow, I'm on track to make $50,000 this year, invest in an accountant. It'll be the easiest 500 bucks, thousand bucks, maybe for a really good one that you have ever spent because they are going to save you more than you spent on them. 
I promise you. Get a CPA or an EA. Don't hire somebody who's not certified. Okay, and then after you set aside the $3,000 for taxes, you're gonna need to set aside another 2,000, I suggest, for savings. So this is like business savings, but also like your personal retirement. Again, this is getting more into it. Like this is like when you've really established yourself as a freelancer. But when you're a freelancer, you're on your own. You don't have a 401k match, you know? You are paying into social security benefits. For the most part, you don't have a company like paying you a pension or anything like that. So you need to watch out for yourself. Start investing in like a Roth IRA or a solid 401k, HSA, all of these things early on. And once you kind of get in the groove of things, money isn't scary anymore. It just money comes in, money goes out, you know? It's more of just a tool that allows you to live the life that you want to live. Also, the last money thing I'll talk about is that you need to have at least three to six months if possible of savings to act as cushion. If you don't have this cushion, you are going to be constantly stressed out. So that's why I always tell people like, do not quit your day job until you have these savings at least three months. Okay, and number five, the fifth and final mistake that I see newbie freelancers make, oh, that bothers me so much and that I really don't want you to make is that they're not resilient. You have to go into your freelancing career with proper expectations. Again, unless you're a software engineer, web developer, mobile app developer, front end developer, one of them developers or something like that, you're not gonna like explode right away. Like you're not gonna be a millionaire your first year. It took me like three years to get to six figures. Like I started freelancing right when I graduated college. I didn't make hundred thousand dollars until I was like 25 but then it started to grow like exponentially and my rates started to get like it, they started to snowball if you're like mid-career or higher and like you have the connects you have the industry connects and the relationships and all that you, you're fine you can just like establish a few gigs first and then quit your job but if you're like new entry level earlier on in your career you definitely want to not quit your day job until you establish yourself it's gonna be a few late nights and a few early mornings. Here's the thing that nobody will tell you about freelancing. The unsexy gigs pay the best. Any freelancer you know is making a lot of money through commercial content, real estate, energy, network security, pharmaceutical, healthcare. Oh my gosh, my highest paying clients by far have been like pharmaceutical companies, but only like the good ones. So as a freelancer, you have a balance. The, the boring stuff pays the most, but it's boring. You can't add it to your portfolio because you don't want to do more of it. It's ugly, it's boring. And then the other side is like really cool projects. Like, ooh, Nike, ooh, Sony, oh, something cool like that. Oh, a music video, oh, an indie short film, but they don't pay. They don't pay as well because there's a lot of people who want those gigs, you know? So they don't, they don't pay as well usually. So you're always trying to balance like, ooh, do I take on more boring stuff that pays well? And then just a few projects that are really cool that I can add to my portfolio. And you eventually over time, it will start to like balance out like this. You'll be able to charge more for cool projects and then take on less boring projects. But it all depends, you know, if your freelancing career is just a means to you being able to like fly first class to make, you know, go on vacation and live your best life, then yeah, take on all those boring projects from the those boring companies like who cares but if you you know really want stuff to add to your portfolio and you really want to take pride in your work and do really cool things then yeah you're gonna need to like suffer a bit more make a little bit less money to get those cool projects like I've done you know internal conference ads for pharmaceutical companies and they pay the best and they're the reason that I'm able to develop my next documentary because they're paying my bills while I'm able to work for free on this project that will eventually pay. So you have to be ready to do some boring work. You have to be ready to do accounting, run a business, be customer service, be your own secretary, receptionist, bookkeeper. It's not glamorous. As you get further down in your freelance career, you can start to outsource things. You know, you can get like a virtual assistant or you can definitely get your accountant and kind of get your team in place. So you have to like give yourself a year, like give yourself a year to really go after it, tweak your MO, tweak your offering, apply to like different jobs in different ways, different places be sending out at least at least 10 to 20 cold emails and linkedin messages a week aggressively sleuth facebook groups i mean get on email list serves like in the film industry i'm on like media mavens holly list production hub staff me up and then the most important thing and this is this is a big mistake people make is that they just take gig by gig by gig that is going to be the hamster wheel of death for your freelance career here's how your freelance career should go the first three years you should be you know, doing that. Take in every gig you possibly can. A lot of different companies, a lot of different people. But each time, make the company just fall in love with you. Make the company just think, wow, this person not only delivered incredible work on time, had a schedule, but they were also incredible to work with. They were funny, they were communicative, they were kind, they were collaborative, they were so great to work with. And that, my friends, is going to retain 
the clients and they'll become what's called retainer clients. They'll come back to you over and over and over again. And that is how you are going to make your real money is you get four of those and you just keep raising your rates with each of them. And it's like amazing. And then you start investing that money and then that money starts working for you. And it's just freelancing can, can set you free. It's, it's the most incredible career. You just have to be a little strategic, a little motivated, a little driven, ready to put your head down and do some work, make some relationships, make some connections, send some cool emails, be a little cringy. But once you do it, it's incredible the doors that it can open for you. And also, you know, freelance careers can easily, easily convert to full-time positions. It happens all the time. Okay, but just to wrap up here, there are a lot of mistakes that you're going to make when you first get started out freelancing. It's just gonna happen and you just have to be graceful with yourself and forgive yourself. But the main thing at the end of the day are those relationships. Try to not mess those up. There are a ton of people that can do exactly what you can do. And the only way that you are going to differentiate yourself from others is your personality. It's by running your freelance business. A white glove, end-to-end, -end, seamless experience. That's, that's how I think of my freelance business and that is the secret sauce so woo that was a lot <laughs> um, but I hope that you were able to learn something and if you're interested in learning more about freelancing you can always sign up for my freelancing 101 webinars which are entirely free I unveil a lot more about the three phases that are key to becoming a successful freelancer and it really breaks down like how to really get started while minimizing risk so if you're interested in learning more definitely go down to that link remember you got this and I'll see you next time